Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw signs that he was what he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with the disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had been eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign of, that they had done, that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they, they were about to do and come take him by force to make him a king, he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was dark. Jesus has not yet come to them. The sea began to became, begin to be rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him in the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Some context here. We were talking before the service. I live in this community. I retired to live here. And um, I have my car serviced. There's a little shop called Bob's right behind McDonald's down the street there. So I drop my car off at Bob's, and he always tells me how long I'm going to be waiting. So I go for a walk. I start, and I walk down the street, cross Grand River by Walgreens, and I come up this path by this pond here. And I come up and I spend my time walking through the cemetery here. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating cemetery to walk through. And I've learned a lot about the community here. So I was going to talk about miracles and King David today. And when Gene and I had talked, I, had wrote, I wrote my sermon a month ago. And I trashed it yesterday because I had a better idea, which happens. It just happens. But I do want to say one thing about David. If you want to have a really rip snorting Bible study, do that reading right there. And only allow divorced people in there and see what happens. And you will hear some really good stuff. And the lesson on King David is, you know, my first comment is he would be a bum, which he is in reality. But he's the Davidic king. That's who they were crowning Jesus to be, his successor. So David is as flawed as they can get, and then some, and then some. And then the miracles we heard about today. There's, according to what I've been able to find out, there's 37 miracles in the four Gospels, okay? Some of them repeating all of them. The two we heard today are the only ones, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water, are the only ones that are in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Only ones, only ones. So let me begin and let me ask this question, because I always ask it of myself. Because what I ask of people, I ask of myself. 
How would, you, how would you describe your relationship with God? Is it good? Would you describe it as good? Would you describe it as seeking? Do you have faith you're going in the right direction? Are you doing what you think God would want you to do? Or are you stuck in a rut? Do you get stuck in a rut? Now, they say when you listen to someone preach, you learn a lot about them. And if you think priests and deacons and bishops don't get stuck in ruts, we dig ourselves in deep. And sometimes we have a, to get out. And the bishop, when I was active in the diocese, wisely made us all have a therapist and a spiritual mentor, a spiritual counselor. We had to go. There wasn't no, he gave us credit towards our educational credits, but we had to do it because we can come unglued just like anyone else. And we th might think we're right, and sometimes someone needs to put us back in our place, because we all don't walk on water, believe me. Um, and I wrote this sermon because I remembered a book I had read. It was called Dream Releasers. And it was writ written by a gentleman by the name of Wayne Cadiero, C-A-D-I-E-R-O. Wayne Cadiero's claim to fame is he founded a church in Honolulu and Hawaii called New Hope. Wayne Condiero is a year older than me and he retired a few years ago. Now all he does is write and lecture and he, he preaches and uh, Wayne's average Sunday service attendance is 23,000. So he must be doing something right to bring people in. And he wrote this book Dream Releasers. It's the first of a series of four books. This one is, is draws you in. The next three focus on you personally. And the question he asks at the beginning of the book is this. What is the richest plot of ground on this earth? If you had to look at the whole earth, what's the richest plot of ground? And he leaves you to think about it from the first chapter till the end. Now, There's a lot of people who aren't satisfied with where they are, they are at in life, either professionally, relationships, spiritually. They're not satisfied. And it's a problem, but it's easier said to fix it than to do it. Way easier to said. said. People's dreams, according to Wayne, can turn into ministries if we let them. But guess what? People's dreams become locked up in them. Now last week I said, I, I said it at, a, at my family that I thought I was called to the church and my dad responded pretty quickly. You know, you're either going to be a doctor or a lawyer and if you're a screw up, you're going to be an engineer. But no one is going to work in the church. And it kind of get, get, went against, against what they had done because they had, they had taken me to church every Sunday from the day I was born. And I thought, this is pretty hypocritical because all I've listened to is messages of doing right and doing what God wants, and you tell me that's the wrong way to go. You tell me that's the wrong way to go. Now, I've often said that I learned a lot, like most of us do, from our parents. We learn a lot. And my dad was no exception. And he would always talk about what it was like to be in combat, what it was like to grow up in the Depression, all that. And because of his experience in World War II, he had what we call today PTSD. Back then, they call it shell-shocked. He was shell-shocked. And uh, his only relief for shell shock was alcohol. And as he drank, he became more relaxed but he became more vocal. If you want to know why I'm not a drinker, I can tell you where it originated from. But I remember he got involved in our church. I grew up in an Episcopal church. And he was senior warden, junior warden, treasurer, secretary, all this stuff. He was a civil engineer. He helped design their growth. He did all this stuff. But it would take a toll on his family when the doors were closed, when alcohol started. So I remember one day, he said, he said he was sitting there, and this was probably, probably two to three martinis in, 
He said, I'm going to form a committee. It's going to be the Mike Davenich for God committee. <laughs> My mom kept telling him, shut up, Mike. The kids, you know, they're impressionable. So spin ahead 50 years at my dad's funeral. I did his funeral. I was the priest. And I invited anyone that wanted to say anything. What do you want to say? So my sister stood up, and I always know this is trouble, because she's more unfiltered than I am. And she said, well, that's God one, Mike zero. <laughs> I said, oh, OK. Now I know where this is going. No one else is talking. So. Let's talk about relationships when we dig into them. Let's talk about God. And is there a plan for each one of us? Does God have a plan for all of us? And the disciples, we use them as an example, they'd been through some tough times. They had been through the beheading of John the Baptist. They just went through the feeding of the 5,000. Now they watched Jesus walk on water. And these guys weren't the cream of the crop. Believe me, they weren't the elite society. And they had seen some real stuff. And Jesus knew at this point they needed to do some R&R. &R. They needed some help. And the problem was that wasn't God's plan. That's human plan to get check out. God had something else in mind. I'll ask this question. How often do you need to be alone with God before you understand what you think you're called to do? It's an interesting question. And I'll tell you, I'll give you my example. I wasn't certain about going back into the church in a, in a capacity. So I went to the Whitaker School in Detroit. You're probably familiar with the Whitaker School. And when I went into it, it was discern your path, whether it be laity, deaconal, and priest. And I went in and I had a class of uh, I'll tell you about the, one of the classes. There was 10 of us in the class. And then there was a deacon and a priest that were leading it. And there was nine women and myself. And so we would get real world scenarios, real world, real, real world scenario. Gentleman comes into a grocery store on a Friday. He's cashing his check. His wife is pleading with him that his five kids are at home starving, and, but he's going to take that check and go to the bar. And they argue, and he hits her and knocks her out. What do you do? What do you do as a church? And so I listened to all my peers, and then I responded. I said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give him exactly what he deserves. I'm going to knock him out, and I'm going to take him down. And I said, this is justice being served. Well. That kind of stuck with me going through the process then. And when I got to the end of that discernment year, I didn't feel called. And if I was called, I, I could be a deacon, because you can be a deacon and still be in the world, still hold your job, still do all that. If you become a priest, you tend to, the, the, the rules change. And so I expressed that. And the director of the school said, you are anything but a deacon. She said, you are a priest. And she said, I don't make this recommendation lightly. She said, you need to go where they can channel your activities and your thought train, because you don't fit the normal mold. You come about things differently. You tend to like to be in charge. And so I, well, I'll follow this path and see where it leads. So I was questioning that. I was really questioning that. And I used to work in Royal Oak. I lived in Plymouth. So I was driving home, and I was questioning in my mind, you know, I got this really good job. Do I want to do this? And maybe I'll just retire and get involved with the church. But I was driving along, and I, 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 I threw out a challenge. I said, if I'm called, give me a sign. Show me something that tells me I should do this. And if you're, if if you're going to give me a sign, I will listen. So I turned off. I was working up. On, I turned on Woodward Avenue, and traffic was really backed up. And by the time I turned on the 275 southbound, it was, it was unbelievable, the traffic. Cars were parked everywhere. Everything's going. There's two news helicopters circling up above. And I looked over. 
and there was an Indian elephant walking with three small elephants. They were holding each other's tail, walking up the sidewalk next to the freeway. And I said, oh, you win. You win. And, and I read about it in the news and what it was. The trainer for the circus didn't have any idea that you couldn't walk elephants by the freeway. You know, didn't cross that guy's mind at all, but it certainly crossed everyone else's at that point in time. And so I figured that was God barging in in a very specific way. And you know, no matter how big or important we are, God is bigger than us. God is bigger. And I believe God's desires trump ours for ministry if we define it and we're willing to move into it, if we're willing to move into it. And God had a plan for the disciples. They needed to be listening, just like we need to be listening. And I would venture that God understands every excuse you can throw at God. I don't think there's much that you can't throw at God that God hasn't heard in the billions of people that came before us. And being as though God created us, I think God may understand us a little bit and may have some knowledge in how our brain works. And so we put up resistance. And one of the resistances, one of the arguments I hear is if, if God is so active in this world and if God wants us to be involved, where is God? Where is God? Why isn't God here now? Why isn't God talking to us? Why wouldn't God talk to us? Well, if you go back and look in scripture, ask Lazarus that question. Where was God when he was put, in the, put into the grave? Where was God? God answered, but it wasn't quite what Lazarus or his sisters thought. The other thing, if you go to the Wailing Wall, which I talked about last week, all those people are asking the same thing. Where is God? Where is God? After all, we're the chosen people. We were chosen 4,000 years ago before anyone else, and we feel abandoned. And then you spin that ahead to World War II and the Holocaust, and you can imagine, where is God? Where is God today? We always ask that. God's reasons are God's reasons. Someday, someday, I hope to understand. I hope to be able to understand why the world is where it is. You know, our world is in a big mess. There's no doubt about that. I could preach this week just on a few politicians and really I'd probably get tossed. But you know what? Our world changes every day. And it is what it is. This is the world we, we live in, the hand we've been dealt. And so my belief, my belief is that it is God's desire that we learn and grow. Because none of us are born knowing where we're going to be and how we're going to end up. None of us have that. You know, I tell my wife, I said, you know, if I could, if I could, and I could pick my exact day I'd die, I'd be broke on that day. But I can't pick it, so I have to be careful, because I know you'll probably outlive me. And so we're cautious. But we don't know. We don't know where we're going to end up. And the answers we get aren't always the easiest. They're not always the easiest. And I want to relate a couple storms I had in my life. We all have storms, but I'm talking about the process that I went into to be ordained. And I was ex explaining it to Philip this morning. There's 53 steps when I went through it. Each one is a milestone. You gotta do this, 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 and this. One of the first ones is you have to sit with a psychiatrist. And they get to pick your brain apart. And then they write a report and talk about a gatekeeper. Oh, I'm so smart. If I don't like you, the bishop will toss you. Well, okay, I'll play your game. And so I said what I thought was my truth because he asked me, because I was married once for 10 years to my first wife. I've been married for 40 years. The second one took. But I said, you know, I probably wasn't the right thing to say, but I said I'm going to light a candle every day for her second husband for taking that albatross from around my neck. And it wasn't what the psychiatrist wanted to hear. And so the bishop got a hold of that. And he says, you need to be a little more calmer in those moments in time 
take your business background out. You don't need to be aggressive. And so I went in the seminary. So one of my seminary professors put it so really well, so really well. She said, if you were to sum up the struggle you have in life to succeed as far as your faith with God, what word would you sum it up in? In one word, one word to sum up your faith and everything you've done your whole life. Anyone have any ideas? And this, this was a Catholic nun beating the rest of us over the head. It was systematics theology. The word is salvation. The word is salvation. We're striving for salvation. And it's with faith and hope we get there. It's with faith and hope we get there. Now, do I hold on to things from the past? Am I an injustice collector? Well, the ordination process, the last thing, the, there's two things you do. You meet with the standing committee and you meet with the same psychiatrist you met with four years earlier. And the point of this psychiatrist is to see if you've become unraveled or you're a heretic, and hopefully you're not. And he gave me a test. He says, I'm, you know, we administer these tests. And he gave me the Minnesota multiphasic test. Now, I have an extremely good memory. And my extremely good memory picks out patterns. So I saw the patterns in this test after I was in about 10 questions. I could see what was going on. We're just going to rephrase something and trip you up and see, if you, see where your belief system is. So I did the test. And then he interviewed me. And then he called me in for the results a couple weeks later. And he, he said, you are the most gifted liar I have ever seen. I said, well, I gave you exactly what you wanted, all the answers to the questions. I didn't deviate, did I? He said, no one does that. And I said, some people do. I said, I'm just going to admit to you I did it. And I can see what you were trying to do. And he said, well, we're going to have a problem because you're, you're not going to be able to handle ministry because you're asthmatic. I said, really? I said, I've been asthmatic since I was five years old. I was running a Fortune 200 facility with 250 employees making life and death decisions, and that's going to stop me when I get into a church and a vestry meeting? I said, are you kidding me? I said, let me tell you what I really think of you. And so, unfortunately, I did. And I said, what you do as psychiatrists is you create your own scenarios, and you filled up the DSM manual with 400-some codes. And I said, two of them I'm guilty of right out of the gate. I said, I hate math, and math deficiency is one. And I hated my siblings, which most people do. And I said, you describe that as a mental weakness. And I said, that's a human strength, and that's human reality. And I said, I don't believe in your profession, not you at least. So I went home, and my phone rang. It said, Bishop. I said, oh, God, here we go. And he only said to me, he said, did we have fun? <laughs> I, said, I said, I hate people trying to put their thumb on me and make me squirm. I love a conversation. I love equality. But I hate that I'm better than you stuff. And he played that card on me, and I didn't like it. He played it on me three years ago, and I tended to remember it because I do collect injustices sometimes. But I was ordained, I was ordained. I moved out and, you know, moved on. And so I always ask myself, God is asking us to examine our lives continuously, continuously. Step out into the storms and have a little faith. Step out into them and have a little faith. I can't tell you how many times since I've been a priest I've gone into situations I didn't have a clue what was going to happen, and I came out of them. And I told the bishop, I said, one of the, he said, his words to me were, he, says, the ta he said, the challenge for me is keeping you in line. And I said, the challenge for me is not hitting the bottom when I jump off a cliff. And I haven't hit bottom yet. He says, yeah, and so we, we make a good pair. And I always liked that kind of attitude with us. I had faith. God won't let us fail if we have faith. Just like D Jesus didn't fail. In fact, just the opposite. 
The disciples were heading this way. Jesus came along, took them that way on the lake, took them another way. I had a great life and I had a great career before I came into the priesthood. I could have gone back to it. There were many times when I was in those 53 steps where I said, I just may say what I'm really thinking today, and then I'll be going back to my career, which is not all that bad, but I knew I was called to something. And I was explaining to Philip, there's, we take um, ordination exams, and they're five days long, and they're eight hours a day. And they hand you an envelope, and they say, fill it out and bring it back at the end of the day. And it tells you what you're supposed to write about. It tells you how many words. tells you can you use resource, because it can tell you not. And one of the questions I got was, you have a parishioner whose wife just died, whose wife's dog is now dying of cancer, and he's asked you to bless the dog. Do you bless the dog? Do you do it? Well, technically, according to the church, animals don't have souls. And so you have to walk around that, walk around it, and give them the answer they're looking for. So when I did the answer, I did it exactly as I thought it should be. But then I called the bishop, and I said, Bishop, I'm not being honest on one of those questions. He said, which one? And I told him. He says, what are you going to do when faced with that in real life? I said, I'm going to drown that dog in holy oil. I am going to bless him so well, he's going to slip right into the ground. I said, because I see that dog, I'm hoping my dogs are in heaven waiting for me. And he says, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. So I knew I was on the right path. So if you're listening to God, your boat's going to come in at the right place in the right time. Now I want to go back to what Wayne Cadero said in his book, Dream Releasers. He asked the question about what's the richest plot of ground on this earth, and I mentioned it when I came in here. It's the cemetery right there. It's the cemetery. Because that's the graveyard that has all the unsung brilliant ideas, ministry hopes, and dreams that could have transformed the planet that went into the ground. They're all out there. That's the richest ground on this planet. Wayne's point is, don't die with that wealth inside of you. Give it back to the world, because there's things you can do. God needs us all the time. You know, our burial will be with unobtained successes and unrealized dreams unless we listen to God, unless we go in that way. And I'll tell you right now, there's always time, as long as you draw a breath and you're in this earth, there's always time to get on board with God. Amen. Together, let us stand and affirm our faith. Do you believe and trust in God, our Creator? We believe and trust in God, our Creator, Creator of heaven and earth. We believe in God as love, well, and all those who live in love, live in God, and God in them. Do you believe in